So hey everyone, I'm Andrew Dobe and welcome to episode 14 of Just a Chat With. Uh, before we get started with today's episode, I just want to let everyone know that Lewis, my co-host, has recently gone on to Pastures New and is off to some plur- ex- uh, sorry, explore some new opportunities. We've both had an amazing first season um, and experience working together on the show. It just wouldn't have been the same without him. Uh, I want to personally um, wish Lewis all the very best um, for his next adventure. If this is your first listen, um, Just a Chat With is a video podcast series where we talk about brand and creativity with the world's best in class. Up until now, this has been a video podcast where we travel to meet our guests in their studios, in their homes. Um, we, we, we think that adds a little bit more to the show. Um, hopefully, we'll be back to doing this again um, uh, sometime soon. And who knows, it may be a mix of travel and remote episodes. So we'll see. In the last episode, we sat down with Debbie Millman, who is a writer, educator, artist, curator, and designer, who is also well known as the host of the podcast Design Matters. Um, Debbie, of course, had some amazing insights on brand and design, uh, being an author and podcast host herself. She is an exceptionally great communicator, uh, and I think was able to explain some simple terms, some concepts that can be really tricky to articulate. So go check that out if you haven't already. Before that, we had James Greenfield. James is the creative director, co-founder of branding agency Koto. Uh, We've also had design legend Michael Wolfe on the show. We've had author um, and brand legend uh, Marty Neumeyer, photography duo Sane Seven, and Noah Klokek, an art director from Pixar. Today, though, we are very excited as we're here with none other than Frankie Goodwin, who is a creative director at Saatchi & Saatchi. Frankie is also the CBO of Western Edge Pictures uh, and Janaker Group. Have I, have I pronounced that correctly? <laughs> yeah, but don't worry. That's it. We're, we're there. We're there. Um, Frankie is a graduate of Glasgow School of Art. Frankie spent the first part of her career uh, running a boutique film marketing agency, Frankie and Johnny, uh, making groundbreaking campaigns for the film industry. Since then, she's worked across numerous award winning film entertainment and brand campaigns, including winning over 80 international advertising awards, including nine canned lions. Frankie, so much, uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, how, how are things with you? Very good, thank you. Cool, and, and how, are you, how have you been finding things over the last, um, so this, well, in this new upside down world we find ourselves in over the last few weeks and couple of months? Yeah, it's, it's been a while since, I've, you know, we, we went, we locked down about 12 weeks ago, I think. Um, and the transition has been surprising. I think people, the technology was always there. Like, we just didn't quite trust it. Yeah. And now, um, and now all of a sudden, it, it's kind of a, a different world in the sense, in the sense that we, we can communicate and we can do Zooms and everything feels fine. Um, but I do miss the, the kind of getting in a room and trotting things out. I think there's a, I think there's a, a lack of kind of, I think we're as creatives and, and certainly, um, marketers, we're, we're kind of a, a bit, um, addicted to kind of positive reinforcement. So yeah. I think unless we're in rooms being told we're brilliant all the time, we get a bit, we can get a bit sad. Um, and that, I think that's the thing. It's like, Oh, you know, that just the energy because I'm working in advertising, especially is and you know, and film development is super fun but it is it really is the people yeah so whilst the work is doable and i think we've been doing really 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 meaningfully um helpful work for our clients you know, mm-hmm. they, they, you know there's there's almost like a slightly different relationship happening because everybody's like what the hell is going on right we have to get this out um so I think that's very positive, but ultimately, yeah, we need to be around people. We need to be telling each other we're great all the time. Yeah, there's something about that energy that you don't get quite across the screen, is it? That, you know, for when you're brainstorming and you come up with ideas that when you're in a room together. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I, I mean, um, have, have you any idea when you'll kind of, you guys will be ending up going back into the studio? Have you any plans for that yet? Or is there? Uh, well, weirdly, I went in last week to pick up my stuff and collect mm-hmm. my awards, which are very heavy. Um, <laughs> um, I, um, the the plan i think from a publicist wide group is to um give people the option to go in from the beginning of july um and there that's built around um i think i think it's like something to do with whether you need the technology or you just need the headspace or whether you need to collaborate so it's sort of a um i think there is a plan but ultimately there'll be no 
requirement to be back in the office this year, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, well, I suppose we, I should probably let the listeners know that we're on Friday the 26th of June today. This is when we're recording this because uh, the world changes day by day. So, um, you know, everyone's plans are changing day by day. Um, I mean, recently in our studio, Frankie, we've, we've decided to... Um, um, start a kind of work from anywhere policy. Um, you know, we, we I, I kind of we, we've kind of moved towards feeling like it might be a blended approach for the future in terms of like some time in the studio and kind of that flexibility. Um, do, do, do you think there'll be more businesses kind of move to that kind of model? Um, you know, from from. I really hope so. I think I think it, I think it will help parents. I think it will. And I don't want to just say women because I think what I've actually noticed is that you know the the men I work with are now are you know taking their kids to school and that's brilliant you know this idea that childcare had meant women had to sacrifice their time in the office i think if if we can see sort of a more meaningful change in in that direction yeah. and the shared burden of that i think that will be the greatest thing that ever happens yeah uh, and that you know um and i think people being just more open to kids walking into zoom calls and screaming in the background and stuff like that yeah. Is it's nice. It's nice to see people actually have lives and families behind their their professional careers, isn't it? I think there's, some, there's been something really nice about that. So I hope. I mean, I don't think. I I really do think this is an acceleration of something that would have happened anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. The positive things that will come out of it. That we will we will get together when we need to get together, but yeah. it will be afforded more flexibility. And who knows that even may mean people can don't have to live in tiny little flats in horrible parts of London. You know, um, and that that there's there's just more flexibility about you know because uh, who no one misses the commute. No, nobody, yeah. no one wants that. So, yeah, and it, and I think people are putting that time into quality of life. Um, yeah. So let's let's try and keep as much. As no, possible. I agree, and I think you know like the, the uh, less people commuting is better for the environment. It's just it's got so many positives, hasn't it? I think, and it's better for your mental well being. Everything just and uh, you know spending more time with the family and and I think there, there's something about. You know, I, I found anyway, often, you know, when you're kind of in the rat race of, of, of um, you know, running and moving around all the time, you don't actually get you know, the time to kind of do a lot of the hobbies and the creative things that you, you have and want to do. So, I mean, I've been picking up my guitar again for, for the first time in years and, and getting, you know, feeling really creative that way as well. I mean, uh, have you found, you know, have you found that from your perspective? Is there things that you're doing? Are you getting to spend more time on sort of self-initiated creativity? Or, I mean, you're obviously very busy with work. <laughs> Um, I I would love to tell you I've been painting and, and <laughs> stuff, which I have which I and I haven't but I think what's been nice is that I run our I work with my husband on our film company so he runs mm-hmm. it and I'm, I'm a kind of um, part-time executive um, so we've had more time to talk about projects we've had more I've had more time to read scripts I've had more time to be a bit more involved in the creative side of web which has been great yeah yeah um and is, is there anything as part of kind of you know have been forced to work from home forced to work remotely is there anything you and, and your team have found in terms of creative process that's changed or is there anything that you you, you might keep moving forward or you, you know obviously the preference is to be around people in, in that room kind of coming up with ideas together but is there you know have you, have you found any positives coming out of this i don't i don't know i th- i think i think it really because there's so many different parts of you know, a, of what I do. And I, re- recently that there's been a lot of, I haven't, uh, let me start that again. I haven't been at the right at the beginning of a brief until about two weeks ago. So for the, the couple of months before that, it was delivering projects that were, you know, actually doing quite a lot of post, which was challenging. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we were, doing loads loads and loads and loads of rounds of iterative feedback and things like that on on work that had been in the pipeline for a long time yeah um and so over the last couple of weeks we've had some chunkier new briefs um that we've been working on that not covid briefs because obviously yeah. we've got to, taken over with covid briefs for a while which were sort of short fast rounds and that's very easy to do on zoom because you've got no other choice they've got to be fast you've got to just make decisions yeah. and get with it I'd- i think the chunkier bigger stuff that i'm now getting our teeth into which is like you know brand planning for next year or you know mm-hmm. bigger brand platform stuff um i haven't done any pitching but i would you know i think that's harder yeah. um, i don't know if there's anything creatively i think i just i guess honestly it's more just about the fact that instead of sitting at your desk coming up with ideas or in a room you might go outside or you know yeah. 
go for a run and have a think about it. I mean, there's something, I found there's something quite nice. Like you almost feel like you've got unlimited meeting rooms. Uh, you know, often in a studio, it's like you need to get certain people in the room and it takes you, oh, we can't do that till tomorrow because they're out, they're out and you can't get a room. Now you can like, you know, we, you could go from here into a room with another five people and so on and so forth. There's, there's something quite empowering about that, about being able to get people together quicker. Absolutely. There's guys on my teams that spent 50% of their time trying to negotiate meeting rooms. I mean, like, you know, <laughs> and then that is not a good use of resource. Oh, in definitely. Any world. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. No one misses the meeting room fights and so, they were substantial at Saatchi, I can tell you that. So, so what, what does a kind of average day then look like for you at Saatchi and Saatchi at the moment? Kind of, you know, what, what is, you know, we, we've got a lot of young creatives that um, obviously follow and listen to this podcast and I'm sure they'd be quite interested to kind of figure out what that looks like for you in your type of role. Um, at the moment or in the normal in normal world? I think um, at the moment it, it's getting up um, and doing some exercise so that you don't go mad. Um, and um, and then ugh, get onto Zoom calls. I mean, I literally get onto Zoom calls. And on a good day, maybe the first one's at 10.30 and, you know, I've got a nice gap in the afternoon where I can go for a walk and have a think and, um, you know, actually do some writing or whatever it is that I need to do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's just a huge amount of Zoom calls. Um, on I, I work across three brands, so um, yeah, just sort of managing. Can you see what they are, or is that? Yeah, um, yeah, I, yeah. I work on Direct Line. Yeah. In insurance. Um, oh, is this the Robocop and Turtles? I've I've seen yeah. this campaign. I love this. Thank you. Yeah, talk us through a little bit of that how that came together. Yeah, absolutely. So that was um. That was a, it was kind of the biggest brief, certainly the biggest brief in the agency um, a couple of years ago because we'd, we'd done the Winston Wolf stuff. I, not personally me, but sure. um, we had, we, you know, had a huge um, kind of commercial and creative success with that brand vehicle. Yeah. Um, and it was a wrench, um, but it's something that I think the client and the agency both felt we needed to do, which was to move on from, from Harvey. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so that was kind of scary. So the brief was called at the time, Life After Harvey. And it was kind of like, it's their life after Harvey. You know, it was kind of, it was that sort of um, uh, a top level of like, you know, ha, ha, what, where do we go? Yeah. Um, and uh, my boss Guillermo, who was relatively new, came, um, came, came over from New York. Um, we were just getting to know each other. And he said, I want you to do Life After Harvey. And I was like, great, okay. <laughs> No pressure. Yes, pressure. <laughs> um, because yeah, no, it is one of those one of those books. I think Richard Huntington said, you know, they'll write books about this if we fuck this up. And all that. <laughs> um, so we, yeah, I mean, it was it was a traditional process. We explored lots of things. The nice, the the wonderful thing about that relationship that um, Derek Line and and Saatchi have is that there was an awful lot of trust. And you know, m at that point when you're moving on to a completely new brand campaign you the normal thing to do is to put out the pitch um so the fact that they they didn't because they wanted to build um with yeah. us was was brilliant but we still had to crack it you know there yeah. was, but it still felt like a pitch mm -hmm. um and um so yeah we went we you know we we got into it it was Guillermo and i's sort of first time working together which was great it was a real baptism baptism of fire in that respect um but mm -hmm. brilliant um, and yeah, we got to this platform, which is about, um, you know, we want to beat superheroes mm -hmm. at the game at saving the world. Um, and where, where, where do you get from blank page to that? Right. And, you know, cause it's, it's turtles, isn't it? It's a uh, Robocop and it's Bumblebee. Yeah. That's the, the, the yeah. So we, get, we got to the, the thought, which was, I think the original, I think the boys that wrote it, um, Wilhelm and Will Brickwell, um, they, I think what was in the deck was something like direct line got there first i think that was the thought mm -hmm. uh, yeah yeah uh and i think soon we sort of we latched onto that we liked that mm -hmm. and then very quickly i think they did a mood film where they comp together all of like literally the world superheroes and and cops and famous detectives and everything mm -hmm. um and put it into this enormous mood film Mm -hmm. that um basically just said we're better than all of these people and and we and we and we wrote the first scripts that were basically like this like you know really 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 epic production and then at the end of the script someone getting into a cab and saying sorry mate direct line have got me covered yeah 
Um, and initially, we the thing we wrote had lots of lots of superheroes in one ad. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was kind of like, you know, rushing through like certain, you know, all all these famous things. And I think <laughs> I think we costed out the first ad at about sixteen million pounds. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say. Then you looked at license and cost. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so we and and it's funny. You sometimes can't see the wood for the trees. Yeah. Or development and so you're sort of saying but well, can can one superhero possibly work you know in one mm-hmm. ad we started to dig into like well we really do need a, a we need to do a business prop and we need to do a motive ad and we need to do a home insurance you know we can't just do one ad with one with you know with motor because that's whilst that's the biggest part of direct line business they are growing everything else um yeah. so then we were like well can we you know do three ads and it, and and write individual stories for each one of them and we did it and we explored all different ways putting two in yeah. you know like and it's funny because you kind of it feels so simple now um <laughs> but we, we wrote them and we were like yeah this is going to work as long as you know there's if, if you know you can make a whole movie out of these characters we can fill together yeah. um and it was all about blowing up the balloon bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and then popping it that was how we talked about it, it was like putting as much epicness as the lawyers would allow mm-hmm. uh, is we wanted to smash things up because you know the whole point is you don't need someone to come and make things worse and that was what was brilliant about Winston Wolf was yeah. that he was the guy who was like you haven't you know I was never here you know mm-hmm. and that's how you want insurance to feel you want you want you just want it back you want it fixed and you want to move on yeah um, and, and it was interesting actually just to because we did sort of I think initially think well, well we could replace the fixer we could replace Winston Wolf with another awesome problem solver yeah. and then you start to look at superheroes and you're like god they make an awful lot of mess <laughs> and they kind of like really want all the limelight you know and um, which doesn't leave room for the brand and that yeah. was where we we got where we got to the sort of the the we're on it idea which was actually this is about superiority this isn't about replacing when someone with a superhero it's about saying we're better than all problem solvers now um, and yeah. So, and, do you, and do you work with the IP owners do you, um, of those characters and, and their writers or, you know, is that something that has to be kind of signed off as a part of the process? It was, it was actually fascinating. I mean, I've worked a lot, obviously, because my background is in movies, but I, mm-hmm. and I knew what, I knew what the restrictions were, and, you know, I'm very used to working with the restrictions of what you can, you know, what kind of advertising you can create for movies based on what the rights holders will be happy yep. with to get involved in that stuff. But um, at this scale, what we did is um, we brought in a guy called David Bourne, who is a, he, he specializes in licensing. Okay. Um, and we sat in a room with a deck that he brought in with like 150 titles that we could license, everything from sort of, you know, Robocop to Paw Patrol. Yeah, um, yeah. We're, we're good with the Paw Patrol. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and we went, literally went through them all, working out like which ones could be maybe relevant for um the props as well because it was like well you know having a transformer would be great for the for car insurance and donatello lives mm-hmm. in the sewer so that's kind of plumbing you know so we were trying <laughs> yeah. to find some relevance it wasn't just saying it wasn't just going oh like you know who says yes because the other challenge is obviously we weren't just saying can we put your superheroes in our ads we were saying can we beat them you know can we kind of humiliate them yeah 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 and so there was a and david did the most incredible job he had these great relationships with all of these rights holders but he originally was like dc and marvel not gonna happen just purely for the concept not not because you know n- nothing to do yeah. with that. um but i think that was fun i think we we got to the guys we wanted we had a few other people we had a few other things on the table we had a bit of an issue about gender but that was like more about the last hundred years of culture than it was our fault in terms of like there are no women superheroes um yeah, yeah, yeah. Like two, and they're really you know they they weren't possible. So, um, and, and, and was there, was there a choice in terms of kind of I suppose the demographic you were talking to the personas? And I mean, because for me, it's they're all things from my childhood. So nostalgia for me, I was like, I'm delighted watching them on YouTube. Um, so I mean, was there a specific demographic you guys were going after as a, a sort of yeah, as a brand? To hit everyone. So <laughs> yeah. what I liked about the suite that we ended up with is that you've got a real, and it's really interesting because we actually had a 16 year old kid and. Um, in one of those meetings that I was talking about with David, mm-hmm. um, as he was on an internship, and so I, we were going through, and I was like, "Have you heard of him?" He's like, "Yeah." I was like, "Have you heard of him?" Like, and like, I didn't know that Transformers are well, you know, are massive because for me they were just these stupid toys, but for like Gen Z, 
they grew up with the movies. So they're like yeah. their favorite movies. Um, whereas, you know, millennials are like super into Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And then you've got, you know, Robocop for the really old people like me. Yeah, um, yeah. I love the Robocop one. It's good, isn't it? I mean, Robocop was the one that we were a bit like, like, you know, less loved. He is a darker character as well. Mm -hmm. I've on Twitter about that, which is like, you know, whatever. It's supposed to be funny. <laughs> I tell my husband, shut up. Born. <laughs> Born. Born. <laughs> um, sorry. All right. Um, he's not listening to me at all. <laughs> so so yeah so there was a demo definitely a demographic consideration um yeah. so we got to where we got to and then in terms of writing um they definitely like i think especially robocop they would look at scripts and then they would say oh he wouldn't say that but he would say you know and they would come back with a suggestion that was like better mm. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Well, that's yeah. kind of good isn't it i suppose because you've got the power of them helping you so and, and you want it to feel authentic most of the challenges that genuinely and i'm not just being you know a politician most of the challenges that the rights holders came back with made the ads better yeah um, and we once we got brian um buckley involved who's the director mm -hmm. you know, he took them from these these love like lovely funny scripts and he just you know he built he built like you know, he, he was the one that wrote the idea of the like rubber coming out and, you know, he kind of built like layers and layers and layers of story on top of them. And then most of the, the kind of negotiation was how much damage can we do and can bumblebees jump through walls and things like that. So, I mean, it was an yeah. absolutely joyful experience. Once we got to the idea um, and we were, you know, and everybody kind of felt good about it and, and we tested it and it tested well. Um, and then the shoot was just the best fun. I mean, you know. Yeah, I think it looks fantastic. I mean, you know, it must be a delight to work on. I mean, in, in terms of kind of process, how, how long does that whole campaign take from start to finish, from kind of blank page to kind of going live? A year. What's Almost that, sorry? Sorry, yeah. Almost exactly a year. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. No, fantastic. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested, um, I suppose, to you know, let's go back a bit and go quick, like how you got into design. I mean, did you always think you were going to be a designer, creative director? Is, is that, was that path that was set for you or kind of where did young Frankie start and where did you think you would head up? So um, I, went, I was definitely good at art in that, you know, I could draw Coke cans and things, which is the, the, the weird sort of bench of whether or not you're going to take higher art. Brushed uh, coke can, yeah, <laughs> or a sheep, a sheep skull, or a, a mouldy orange. <laughs> candles as well, uh, yeah. and lots of face, lots of yourself, you know, lots of <laughs> really angsty self-portraits. Um, so I was good, at, you know, I was good at art. I did, I did art through school, and I definitely wanted to take that into my career. But I definitely knew from a very young age, and I think it's because I have a sort of scientist dad, and I'm quite my brain works like his, even if maybe I'm not, as, you know, not capable of the physics. Um, he, like, I think I was always clear that I wanted to do something that was gonna have a, I don't, I don't even know, sorry, I'll start that again. I think I was always, um, I think I was always sure that I wanted to do something with a kind of vocation. Mm -hmm. So I knew I didn't want to be an artist. I think yeah. that, that absolutely, like my mum is an artist and sure. I don't get up every day with like, oh, I'm going to make a pot or I'm going to, you know, I'm yeah, gonna, yeah. I, I get up, um, what gets me up in the morning is a problem to solve, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think I knew that. And I, the way I sort of articulated that when I was like 16 was like, I would put letters into paintings and thought that was what graphic design was. I don't have a clue. I literally have a clue. And that's the thing, like there's a lot of, you know, the, there's a lot of ignorance in terms of, what job descriptions actually are when you're that age i think certainly yeah you know in the 90s yeah it was, it was like you know i think you know other than the general jobs you know the the, the you know doctor lawyer stuff like you don't do really dig into what other opportunities are out there you sort of left to find out for yourself but i knew i was going to go to art school scotland yeah. has amazing art schools and i think that's also part of why you feel like it's a good choice Yep. nobody says like i don't think you really get that i don't know if you're from I, how can i know but if you're from birmingham and you say i'm going to go and do my foundation course or i'm going to go to art school uh, you know unless you're going to camberwell um or chelsea people are a bit like oh okay 
you know. Yeah, yeah, Whereas yeah. because I think Scot Scotland has these four incredible art schools, um, and they have such a strong re reputation. That and where did you Where did you grow up, Frankie? Where, where were you? Edinburgh. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, up, I, yeah I, went, I grew up in Edinburgh, and um, I was I, also born in Edinburgh as well. So big up us. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so I was kind of like, I, a lot of people were going to Glasgow straight off the bat in first year and I went to Manchester and did a foundation course because I just wanted to get out of Scotland to be honest. Yeah. Um, and then I had no plans, to, I, you know, maybe going to stay in Manchester, but the course in Glasgow, I just, I loved and I met the tutors and I did an interview up there and I just felt like, oh my goodness, it, you know, I've never had something sure surer about anything yeah um because it was a design course that you did still did um life drawing all the way through you know okay. such a sort of respect for the original you know the, the sort of creative skills set the you know the, the really fundamental stuff. and it didn't feel like designers were being sort of you know put in another room with photoshop and and yeah on with it kind of thing there was a real sort of sense of creative ambition mm -hmm. um and all the way through glasgow was just um great just an amazing experience really yeah and then so so after that you kind of you, you landed your first design job and yeah. SEM design is that correct yes so um oh god it, my heart breaks for the graduates this year because graduating mm -hmm. and all of the opportunities that come out of graduating um, were incredible and I think I've got better and better since you know in yeah. terms of being AD. so so what we did is we had a big show in uh, in Glasgow you know and the designers got you know, just as much space as the fine artists um, and you know people come around they give you your cards and blah, blah, blah. Um, and then you also ship down to we also sort of shipped down to London for a couple of days with our work and we did the DNAD which is now called New Blood I don't know if it was called that then but um, oh, okay yeah yeah is you know basically new blood yeah um and um i think they didn't do awards then so it was literally just an op op opportunity yeah um, to meet people and you're kind of like wow you're in the big world and literally people from design agencies came up to you and give you the cards and and um and i think i did a portfolio surgery or something with david stocks who mm -hmm. um was running sas and it, they seem kind of cool and the people seem kind of cool and they offered me a job and it wasn't a placement they offered me a job so yeah. like, and I, that was a good you know it's obviously when you're moving down from scotland you you know placement feels quite scary although i'd still have done it yeah um, and i think um yeah and i was lucky that i had friends that wanted to do the same thing so we all kind of piled down to london and um started you know doing what junior designers do cutting things out and looking for pictures in books <laughs> that ages me um anyway so that yeah so i did that for and it was a great opportunity and i realize now i know now how much i learned and how how i was completely not job ready or in any way fit for purpose when i left art school i had a great you know i had a great time and i did lots of creative things um but you know yeah, you, you kind of get a baptism of fire when you get into the first sort of working world don't you and kind of yeah. understand the, the speed that everything has to move at and you've got to be properly responsible. I think that took me a few months to get my head around. <laughs> it took you a few months. It took me a few years. So <laughs> you've, you've, you've done better than most. Um, so I, I suppose following from um, f from after SAS, um, you founded your own consultancy with your, was it your partner, your husband at the time, Frankie and Johnny? No, no. Oh, I got that wrong. <laughs> yeah, obviously everybody asked us that for 10 years, but no, we, we were just pals. Um, ah, okay. So, yeah, so basically... Uh, Johnny, who was actually called Jonathan and had to rename himself to fit in with the idea of the name of the company. Um, it's really weird because you can basically predate people based on whether they knew him before. Or <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Wife calls him Johnny. People <laughs> 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 from SAS call him Jonathan. Um, so yeah, basically I had kind of got what I could get out of SAS, I think from a kind of um, career point of view and I was a little bit lost. Um, yeah. And Johnny was um, a, a technical consultant for, for SAS who were doing a lot of work for BT and doing some really quite groundbreaking stuff for the time in terms of there's this thing called the internet. Um, there's probably an opportunity there. We're not sure what it is. Um, <laughs> and so I was like ready to leave. And um, Johnny called me and said, what are you doing for Christmas? I don't know, what are you doing for New Year or something? And I was like, I'm resigning. I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm going to resign because I don't want to become the, you know, I don't want to just become yeah. a corporate graphic designer. It's not enough. 
and he was like, oh, amazing. Why don't you come to Venice and help out on this Mike Figgis film? And I was like, what? well, don't say that if you definitely can't, like, what are you talking about? Um, and so basically Johnny had been working with another creative um, called Abby who runs Rude. I think they're still going okay. to Rude London. Um, and they had managed to put together a team that were going to help to basically build M Mike Figgis had, I think basically seen sort of, do you remember the first big brother or the second big brother? They had like 24 hours of CCTV on them on the internet because obviously we didn't have yeah. all the channels that we do now. And Mike thought this was great and wanted to kind of build a film set around that and just have spy on actors and stuff. It was completely <laughs> beautiful. Um, but what we turned it into was a very, very creative project um, where we mm. made um, new content every single day and um, basically kind of built a world around the film being made and all the actors because, you know, there was just actors running around everywhere and kind of had a dogma approach to the whole website. So everything on it was created on set, even the music. We had to find someone to play the piano if we needed some music or we had to mm. find someone thing or well, it, it was incredible it was like going back to college as far as I was concerned but you know I was being paid um and I kind of got there with the well Johnny sort of said oh well we need an assistant yeah. and I got there and it turned out that Abby wasn't coming out for three weeks or something because she was running her her agency and so I was like oh okay and I had lots of talented boys but like there wasn't a real a, a real vision mm -hmm. so um I kind of got back my mojo in a big way because I had to sort of step up and go, what's the vision for this website? What are we doing? Yeah. Um, and it was amazing um, and made friends for life and, and, um, and did something that was ge genuinely groundbreaking. And I would, I say that because I, I always say that I always say, I mean, I don't think in hindsight being a, a, a you know, ahead of your time is that much fun. Mm -hmm. um, being ahead of your time is basically just not, people not paying you for stuff because they don't understand it. Um, so like, whilst it, you know, it sounds like quite a big claim, like, oh, we were so ahead of our time. It was like, yeah, it was bullshit. Um, Cause we, we knew what we were doing was absolutely what the internet was for, you know, yeah. video content, fan bases, but none of it existed. So it was kind of, um, you know, like Salma Hayek fans were hacking our website to take the content off it. And we were like, you can have it. Like we don't, we're trying to, you know, we're creating a I was trying to get something out here yeah but we didn't even really know what what it was anyway we won some awards and we were like well everybody needs needs this every every single film should have us on set making this stuff um and all, i you know obviously had a print background so i was like and we could do posters and we could do you know film titles and you know we could brand films and we started to identify where where independent film kind of failed in it in terms of the way it branded itself and you know the titles didn't look anything like the poster and the poster was designed in different countries and had you know like there was no consistency across across yeah. the world of independent film um and so we thought and the digital offering was like zero so that was sort of the vision for frankie and johnny and it, it took you know it was it was it was a, a wonderful sort of ride trying to convince people that that's what they needed to varying mm. terms of success and failure. And, and did you enjoy the, the, the element of kind of running a business and, you know, the kind of challenge of that or was... Or... Um, I mean, honestly, no. no. I, don't, I, I mean, I think I liked, I was incredibly proud of the team that I built. You know, mm -hmm. I think like it's incredibly humbling when people get out of bed and come to work for you every single day. Yeah. I don't yeah. know, there's something about it that sort of amazing can't quite yeah. believe it especially because i was really young when i i mean i set up frankie when i was like 22. wow um so and we didn't hire anyone for a while so like we, you know, um, but it you know i was incredibly proud of the team yeah in the accounts not so much um the stress of you know turnover and yeah but you know trying to fill pay the bills every month and you know i'm glad i did it and i'm glad that that's part of my like you know, getting to the point where you just know the phone will ring and things will be okay, you know, it's an incredibly good, you know, place to get to in your life. Um, and not, you know, reducing the stress of uncertainty and all of those things. But I have to say, you know, cut to week one of Saatchi and being like, oh, I just have to do the creative bit. Oh my God. And then like someone pays me every month. And I don't, even have, to I don't have to look at spreadsheets anymore. I don't have to do any of that. Yeah. So, so, so I, I have to be really honest and say there is an absolute joy in someone else wearing a bell and that stuff too. Yeah. And, and so how did you end up from there 
to, to where you are at Saatchi Saatchi? You know, how did, how did that come around? So I, I did, Frankie and Johnny, we, we ran until when we got hit by the crash, um, which is quite interesting actually now because, you know, as Corona and the sort of next recession probably looms, I think I feel quite wise yeah. It's like, yeah, done it. I the last one and, you know, good things come out of adversity and, you know, it forces you to make decisions about what you want, you know. So, yeah, I feel like I'm kind of like, oh, okay, this is going to be a 10 year cycle. You know, I, I, I'm getting this now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we got, we got uh, a bit screwed by that. You know, people stopped spending money. We, we didn't, you know, we put your hand to mouth as a small agency. Yeah. And we had to make, you know, we sat down with our accountant and he was like, you could probably fight your way through this but you know do you want to do you want to scale down and do that and I bear you know I think me possibly first and then Johnny was like yeah you know you're right I think it's time for a change and um, I was ready to to do other things I've been living yeah. for a long time never never planned for it to last this long or to run a business age 22 and you know yeah. how many years did that how many years did that run for about nine nine okay yeah yeah um, so I was kind of ready to take a bit of time off. I went yeah. traveling. I I then came back and then decided I hadn't done you know enough traveling. So then I went to Paris and um, lived in Paris for a while and just focused on my own stuff and did lots of drawing and wrote, yeah. learned French and made a book and really took a lot of time. You know, I I I, I took a good few years to myself and I was working, but yeah. not the way I work now. I, I definitely eased off for a while and took, took my life back, I feel. Yeah. And, then, um, and did a bit of research as well. I went to Japan and like got inspired and ready to mm. work. Um, so I felt by the time I decided to come back to London from Paris, which was around 2011, mm -hmm. um, I was so ready to work. You know, I was, I was so yeah. fired up. I was, um, I was, ready for a new challenge. I started freelancing and um, I was working, I'd had met Vaughan by this point, who is my now husband. And yeah. so I got involved um, with Westerners Pictures as well. So we were building a slate, doing some interesting projects. Um, and I was like, yeah, this is a good, this is a good balance. You know, I'm doing mm -hmm. film stuff, I'm doing, um, doing some freelance and, you know, getting more into brands and rather than films. So I was doing yeah. with um, branding agencies. And, um, and then a guy called Lloyd Sammons called me who had offered me a job um, and I was sort of like, I'm happy being freelance, it's all good. And he said, well, it's a slightly different offer now because um, Saatchi and Saatchi are acquiring us. Um, so it's, I'm offering you a job at Saatchi and Saatchi now. And um, I don't know whether if it had been any other agency, I would have been as interested, but you know, Saatchi and Saatchi really is the only advertising agency your mom's heard of. That's what I was going to say. I was going to say that exact thing. It's the one, it's the one name that people who are not in the ad industry, they know yeah. that name. Yeah. And so, and you know, I had done independent things on, you know, all my, everything I'd done was small teams, massive ambition, um, you know, punching above the budget way too much. Yeah. And, you know, really, really great work. And I, I wouldn't change any of it, but the idea that then I would just be offered like a CD role in advertising, which I didn't really know what that was. Um, well, you know, this, I know what an art director is. I know what a copywriter is, but you know, I, I've done most of the, I knew that I'd done the work. I just didn't speak the language really. Yeah. Um, and so I thought, I was like, well, I'm going to say yes to this. This is a great opportunity. Um, mm. so I've got this film company thing. And Lloyd was like, well, let's just say, call it four days a week. And I sort of thought, right, that this is going to last six months, if that, you know, I'm a, I'm not built for corporate life, b, part time work, never, yeah. you know, everyone gets annoyed with you, um, and <laughs> b, um, I don't really know what, like, I don't know. What, I mean, I sat down with a friend of mine who worked, had worked in advertising, and I was like, so what's a planner? And she was like, well, all you need to know about planners is you have to think they're smarter than you. I was like, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> So I don't know. I just, I just sort of, you know, said yes, didn't really know what I was saying yes to. And, you know, that's, that's been seven years. Wow. Well, um, liked it. Yeah. You liked it. That's good. So, so you still enjoy it. You're, you're in a happy place. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, like I said, there was a, there was a real sense of, Oh, you only want me to be creative. That's amazing. 
Mm -hmm. um, and then you just walked around the building just going the scale of the opportunity here is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, and how, is, is, there, is there multiple creative directors in your team? Yeah. Is, how, you know, how many, what does that sort of structure look like? You know, just for... Now, it was quite, it was, I went very, in very much as a digital creative director. Yeah. Because um, the outside line had been acquired as a, to create sort of digital arm of Saatchi. Okay. So it was quite, um, it was a bit of a divide at the beginning. You know, there was mm -hmm. like real creatives and then there was us. Um, <laughs> and I wasn't having any of that because I just had never, I've never um, seen medium as a barrier. Like I've yeah. never, you know, I think that's part of like, when Johnny said to me, do you want to come and build a website in Venice? I was like, I don't know how to build websites. And he was like, doesn't matter. Just come. Like, yeah. I your ideas. And I think that we'd always had that kind of, we'll figure out how, how later, but like, you know, it's concept there. And so I, I wasn't really that interested in what people said I could do and what that I could, you know, I, I just sort of was like, I like working with him. He's a good writer. I'll just go and, you know, and so I started working with um, Will John and we were basically, I was kind of creative. I was working as a creative, but also a digital creative director. Yeah. Um, and then thankfully the, the, those sort of divides, we got rid of because they're just meaningless, aren't they really? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Did like separating digital and above the line, well, you know, TV is, is, is w what would keep Saatchi being old fashioned, you know, and old school. So, so I definitely saw my role was part of the transition and that's why Lloyd hired me was to kind of have some, you know, some people sort of trying to break down some of those silos. Um, and so the first projects I did were, you know, very integrated. Mm -hmm. And then as things have changed, it's sort of, there's, I think there's five creative directors now. Um, yeah. And uh, CCO, and, and that's about it, really. Okay, okay. Uh, and and do, you, do you see that kind of, um, you know, that blend, I suppose, of kind of digital and above the line, etc. You know, are you seeing, you know, is there a, a huge more shift? Obviously, the bigger ad agencies like you guys usually do the big out of home campaigns, but is there more of a focus now on pure digital first? Is, is, is that kind of where it's all kind of gone? I mean, people still need TV ads. And, you know, the direct line work, for example, you know, was, was definitely made a big, massive TV vehicle, you yeah. know, where we sell insurance. But everything is about creating 360, a bit jargony, but, you know, it's, it's not, it's not, it, you go, what's the media plan? You look at the media plan and you talk to your planners about whether you think that's the right media plan, whether that's going to speak to the right people and you build your idea, you know, and, and, a, and, a, and a good brand platform should be able to, its tentacles into all of that stuff so i don't worry yeah. much about it i just you know sometimes you have a great idea for social and pitch it and other times you have a great idea for an activation and you know it needs tv to promote the activation you know like i just i just yeah. don't think too much about the medium i think yeah it's all good fun um i think you can su you know i think sometimes you can suffer from traditional thinking in terms of where budget should be allocated yeah sometimes, and that can be restricted um but other than that, I just, I just, you know, go big picture first and then figure it out. Like, yeah, no, I like that. I like that. Um, the concept wins and then we figure out where it's meant to live and breathe, isn't it? That's the, that's the right way of thinking. Now, um, we, we, we had Marty Newmeyer on the show. Um, he's famously given his definition of brand as uh, his, you know, he says a brand is a, simply a person's gut feeling about a product, service or, or organization. Uh, Debbie Millman um, said that branding is more like a manufactured meaning. Um, uh, then we, we look to, to, uh, to the public to create um, a consciousness um, around that meaning. Um, Jeff Bezos from Amazon, he says kind of branding is simply your reputation or it's what other people say about you when you're not in the room. Now, I don't mean to put you on the spot, um, but do, you know, I, I'd love to know, you know sort of your definition of brand in today's world. Um, and if you were kind of explaining it to your mum, <laughs> you know, what, what, what is branding? Uh, what's branding? I think branding is the relationship you create with things. I think it's mm -hmm. it's about it's a, yeah it's the relate it's 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 yeah it's a little bit manufactured, but it is the relationship you have with the, with the products and services in your life, um, and that isn't always manufactured. I think sometimes that is inc incredibly um, personal, you know why you what you think of when you think of an orangina because you had it once when you were a kid mm -hmm. um, and then so i think i think it's 
I think the, the act of branding is building relationships. Yeah. Uh, but brands inherently have relationships with their customers, you know, with, with, and that's you, you, because you build identities out of the brand. You wear in the, yeah. Why, why do you think we love that as people? Why do you think we like to attach ourselves and kind of join these tribes, you know, because that's essentially what they are, isn't it? It's, you know, we're, we're kind of often saying that we believe in the same things as these these brands are saying, you know, it's, 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 it's funny. I'm, I'm always looking, you know, to myself when I, I make a buying decision or I join something or I sign up and, you know, I just, I just wonder, you know, if, if you have any point of view and like why we're so kind of, we want to connect to things and kind of build ourselves into, you know, attaching ourselves to these these names these brands these identities well i mean why do i think why do we want to do it because we want to feel like we're making good choices um and i think we want to feel like we're in control of the things and the, and the 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 a the image that we put out there but like when it comes to a bank i don't know i think you want to feel like you're making a good choice in terms of their technology their security their ethics um, and so the only way to learn about those is through communications. Um, so it's, but then I sort of think about my relationship with probably the strongest brand relationship I have, have is with Apple. And I know it's a cliche and probably diminishing a little bit these days, but buying an, a, a Mac or being part of that world did feel like being part of a tribe. And it felt like being part of a tribe because it was better and because it saw the world in a simpler way. Mm -hmm. It saw the world, like you took out the, the instructions and the instructions were like, plug in the wall, turn on. And they're like, uh -huh. I am making good choices in my life because <laughs> this is around, this is a better way to live, you know, rather than a booklet in 75 different languages <laughs> that doesn't explain how your toaster works. Yeah. Um, and there was a sense of, I'm, 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 I'm winning, you know, like. I've made the right choices. <laughs> shining thing that has been made with so much thought and consideration and I guess that doesn't just have to be about design it can be about being proud because you made you subscribed to a journal or um, something that you really believe is fighting the good fight in terms of free speech or you know because you think that a, a particular bank does good things or you know because you like their ads I mean what's wrong with that you know yeah oh they don't put ugly things into the world. That's the other thing I think, you know, for me, it's like, do you put beautiful things into the world? Are you making the world uglier or not? Or you know, shop front and direct mail and there are, there are some that do and some that don't, so. Yeah, and, and I think there's, the, there's obviously a, a, a huge conscious change and shift over the last few years or last 10 years even um, in terms of, you know, you know, consumers, they want to see right inside brands as well. So it's not just about the identities or the service offering anymore. It's about their ethics, how they treat people, how they treat their, their team members, how they, how they, how they impact the world. Um, you know, and obviously I, you know, I, there's, I can't remember the name of the site just now, but there's, you know, I found a site um, recently that, you know, during COVID, it was basically a ranking system of kind of brands who's, who's done, who's looked after the world during this and who, who didn't, who did good stuff, who did bad stuff. And, you know, so, so more and more so, you know, I, I kind of believe it's kind of what it's what people say brands are rather than us as the advertise, you know, agencies or the brands themselves. You, you can't almost tell people what you are anymore. It's, it's, it's the other way around. And um, I, I suppose I'm interested, uh, Frankie, to know, do you think, can you see any shifts, any changes um, for the future of branding, you know, based on, I suppose, the experiences, the, the, the work that you've done during COVID with brands as well? And can you, can you see um, sort of any big shifts and changes that you know, where the future of branding is going? Um, I think, I think, like I said at the beginning, I think, I feel like we, our clients, we were working with our clients very much as partners. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's how, how it should be. Um, but pe perhaps that felt a bit more, um, less, uh, less kind of hierarchical in the sense of like, we do what you say, you know, yeah. and I think if there can be, if, if we can get to a sort of more, a level of exchange, you know, that's where the best relationships and the best branding and the best work happens is when you're really partners, you yeah. know, direct, I don't like being called the client. Yeah. I think that's sort of pejorative and I get that, you know, um, and like, they'd rather be called the team, you know, and I think that's, it's semantics, but it's also quite, you know, it's, it's quite yeah. an important thing. Um, and I think, so I think that's something hopefully as a positive, you know, a positive way that we'll work together because we understand that problems are a little bit 
you know, we're, there's not like certain prescribed answers and, you know, yeah. this is about um, serving the client in that way. Um, so that, that I think should change. And I, and I, like mm. I said, like you said, I think there is now more, a sense of accountability. Yeah. What did you do during COVID? You know, I know the website you're talking about. And, yeah, yeah. I can't uh, remember the name of it. We'll, we'll, we'll find it. We'll put yeah, it in the comments yeah. somewhere for someone when they're watching this. Uh. Yeah, but it is really, it is really good. And it, and it launched super fast. It launched within like a week, I remember. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, yeah, that sort of need to be reactive as well and be sensitive to things. And um, if that breeds honesty and transparency and, um, and better, you know, better, more authentic comms, that's, you that's know. a great thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's good for the world. So I'm, I'm conscious of your time. Um, and I suppose we've got a lot of younger listeners, a lot of people, um, a spell that have just graduated. We talked about that earlier on and how, you know, you kind of had quite a, um, you know, a lucky sort of route into getting your first role. And um, there's a lot of people out there that, you know, be quite challenging right now in terms of they've left university, college, they're starting out in the world of work. Um, is there any, any, any tips you could give um, for those listeners to kind of um, some ideas of, you know, I suppose, um, making, the, making themselves, um, I suppose, the, the ones that, that they're most likely get, to get a job? Is there, is there any, 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 any thoughts that you have and kind of? Well, I, I, said, I, was, I, did a, I did a Zoom talk with the graduates of the uh, VizCom GS at oh. Glasgow a few weeks ago, and I was asked the same question. And um, I said, <laughs> sounds ridiculous, but play the sympathy card. You guys have had the worst graduation ever. You didn't get to party. You didn't get, you know, you didn't get to hang your show. You didn't get to, you know, go and network with anyone. You didn't get to go to DNAD. I mean, it's, it, it's like, you guys should be like, literally like I was that year. You need to give me a placement. You need to give me a chance because we got shafted by the world. Um, and I, and I, I say that slightly joking, yeah. but also like, I mean it, like if we, if we have, as, as um, like organize, organizations like Saatchi and also my, my company, West End Pictures, you know, we have internship schemes and um, we try and do right and good by the people that come through. Um, and, and when you get those and nurture those relationships, don't just leave after four weeks and, um, and sort of be too shy to stay in touch and ask for the next person you should go and talk to. Oh, I think good advice I always have was always get one name out of the person that you meet. So don't say like, oh, have you got any contacts for me? Just say, give me one person. Yeah. And then you start a chain. And it's and usually that person will then be more more appropriate um, in terms mm. of your work or whatever, because you give it a bit of thought. So try and get to see people, play the sympathy card, um, get another name from anyone you talk to. Yeah. Um, understand that it's not going to be an easy time so don't take any rejection at this point personally yeah um and keep emailing be annoying because mm -hmm. what's the worst that can happen you're going to be deleted who cares exactly. um, and yeah hang in there like you know the 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 world owes you some fun um and and uh and hopefully you find that in your first job because there's you know good fun yeah, and I think I think it's um, you know for for any of those listeners as well, you know, it's, it's a really good time to reach out to people on LinkedIn yeah. and ask people for help because you know me myself, you know, if, if you know students are reaching out to me, I'm I'm taking calls, I'm speaking to people, and I think so many people will do that now. So the world, you can reach out and and create relationships. And um, once you create that relationship, you have a conversation. Well, you've you've got your foot over the door way ahead of someone else. So so don't be afraid to kind of reach out and ask for help. You need to you need to let people know. Well, Frankie, thank you so much. Uh, as usual with our guests, I could sit here for hours <laughs> and talk. Um, there were so many insights in that, and I'm sure um, our listeners will have got so much um, taken away from all the experience you've had. Um, you, you know, it's been a delight to, to chat to you. Um, real quick before we, we finish up, I just want to give a shout out to, well, I'm going to have to say this username, JKNY605, who rated us on the podcast and said that we are super interesting and inspiring. Thanks for them so much for that. We really love to hear your feedback. So I appreciate that. If you want to support the podcast, um, we'd love for you to do the same. So please rate, um, write us a review and help us get the word out. Um, if you have any questions for us or if you have any guests that you would like to see on the show, make sure and reach out on social media. 
and give us a comment. We'll try our best to accommodate. We generally publish a new episode every, uh, oh, sorry, on the last Monday of every month, sort of, until COVID hit. Uh, put a little bit of a, a speed bump in there for us. So, But we are back and we will do our very best um, to be here every Monday. So make sure you're subscribed. Thanks again, Frankie, and we'll see everyone next time. Take care.